In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord, in today's Gospel, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is being approached by the disciples of St. John the Baptizer. And they are addressing him this question. Why we and the Pharisees are fasting, but your disciples aren't? Why they are not keeping the fasting? Because the fasting was very important from the beginning of times. From the beginning of the creation, when the Lord had put Adam and Eve in paradise, in the Garden of Eden, and told them that you could eat from all of this, but not from this. So the first commandment that he gave to them was the fasting. After disobeying, disobeying the, his commandment, they found themselves naked and out of paradise. Naked because they lost the grace of God that was covering their nakedness. So they were rejoicing in the grace of God. But after the sin entered our life, we were deprived from, from that and we lost that. And we started struggling with hunger. We started struggling with nakedness, with enemies. Even the nature itself turned against us. And as you see in our days, as we are going deep in the pit, the nature turns against us. If you will watch what is happening on a daily basis around the world, the calamities that are happening, you'll freak out. And this is why? Because we are turning our backs to God. That's why. That's the reason. Because our nature is to live in communion with God, in harmony with God. And when we are dividing ourselves from God and we are leaving God, then all these things are happening. And that's why. That's the reason. And as you see, the fasting is... It's an, it's an important thing, but we have to understand the true purpose of fasting and the true way of fasting. Many are fasting today, right? As they did fast in the Old Testament, and that's why they brought it to Jesus Christ. Why we are fasting and your disciples aren't. And he is bringing here an example which was very common for them. He's saying, while those at the table with the bridegroom are sitting, they are not fasting, right? They're rejoicing because it's a big event. And at that time, the wedding was between one week and 10 days. So the people will come, eat and drink, and go home and next day come again. So this was going on for 10 days. And of course, no one would fast those days that the, the wedding will happen because that was a joyful event. And he is saying, while they have the bridegroom, let them rejoice. They aren't ready for this. Now they are just learning. So what they were learning, they were preparing for their future mission. Because as he often was accused, because he wasn't keeping the commandments and the law of the Old Testament, right? He wasn't keeping the, the Sabbath day. And of course, by saying why your disciples aren't fasting, it's an accusation to him also. But he is bringing this example and it's like imagine 
You know, usually when we go to a wedding, we give uh, some gifts to the couple, right? So imagine somebody comes and gives them a gift, a casket for burial. Eventually, at some point, we're going to die. But it's not the right moment to give such a gift to someone, right? Because it's a beautiful event. So, and it, it's not the right place and not, not the right time. So this is what he wanted them to understand. He is comparing himself with the bride, with the, with the groom. Because in the Judaic wisdom, many times God was compared with the groom and the people as the chosen nation, the bride. So that's why it was very common for them, and they understood what he was talking about. And so here, he is comparing, he, he is openly telling them that I am the one that had created everything. And now is the time to rejoice. Right? Now, because I am here, there is no room for sorrow for tomorrow. But now, you have to learn. You have to rejoice with me. And when the groom will be taken away from them, then they will mourn and they will, they will fast. But now, what's the point? It's like to, to cry for somebody that he's still alive and healthy, right? Why crying for him if he's, if he's okay? Why to mourn? There are different cases. But in this particular content, he was, the sorrow would, would come later, but he was preparing them for that thing. And this, this is what he wants us also to understand. Because they had the fasting, which was mandatory for everyone, or they had fasting that was imposed by the Pharisees, by the priests, on particular times. And in, uh, in this context, why they were fasting, probably because uh, there wasn't enough rain. And probably that was the reason they were fasting. And Jesus' disciples weren't fasting. But again, they, were, they had this difficulty, this natural problem, because they could not see God. See, if we would be able to see God and to communicate with God, then we will receive everything we need. But you see, their fasting was just a customary, a custom, it was just something to abstain from food. But this doesn't give you anything alone. And many in our days are fasting, but there are different kind of fasting. So, so, some are giving up everything uh, that has to do with uh, meats and other things, and turn to, to be vegetarians, but that's for a different purpose. That's not to improve the relationship with God, right? Or others are fasting when is the fasting time that the church had given us, but again, they are abstaining only from food. So if you're not eating meats or dairies or whatever it is and you are watching your neighbor you're watching your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's uh, house or your neighbor's business or you're criticizing your neighbor or you're judging your brother or your whatever so what that fasting is due to you nothing see fasting is first of all an act 
of love. Because through love, everything was made and created. And through love, God was born. And through love, he suffered for us. He was sacri uh, sacri sacrificed himself for us. He given up his, his life for us. His entire the earthly life were a sacrifice for the humankind out of love. He himself fasted for 40 days to fight the enemy. And when he came from the mountain, Tabor, he said that this kind of evil cannot be taken out except fasting and prayer. But again, the right fasting and prayer because his disciples couldn't do it, right? So then something is missing. So, and it's missing the love. If you are fasting and you're judging and you're criticizing and you're not helping your neighbor, then that fasting would not bring you any results. Because the results would come only when our heart will be melting out of love. And we will see God's creation with love. We will see each other with love. Only then we can really say that we are fasting. But if you abstain from food alone and you're not doing the rest, it's not going to help you. It's like having the car, but you run out of gasoline. So you have to somehow get a way to, to bring gas to refill it, right? So on its own, the, the car without gas is not going to move. So the same thing, the fasting. Just if you abstain from food and you're not doing the rest, it's not going to help you. And it's, you're not going to be able to see the grace of God. So the fasting brings us closer to God when, only when it's accompanied with piety, with love, with good works, with good deeds. Only then is we achieve the fullness of fasting. And this is what he wanted them to understand and through them us. And yes, the fasting, it's very important. I will, <coughs> I will share with you an example. There was a couple. The wife was very, very faithful and very religious. So when we are saying religious, if you ask somebody, what is a religious person? He would say, well, somebody that uh, wear a cross, prays, goes to church, is fasting, right? This is now our understanding a religious person. But that, again, is not all. You know, being a religious, it's a long way to go. So, and this woman was, was very pious, and uh, she was attending the church. She was helping the poor and she was fasting very strict. At some point, her husband was, wasn't religious at all. At some point, he got really pissed with her, and, and uh, it was because she, he wanted to eat something, and she prepared, she cooked the fasting food because it was the fasting period. And uh, she started cursing and went outside mad and uh, he went uh, to the animals so what happened their cow that was a very very calm animal when he approached ran towards him and with her with the horns destroyed him completely and he died 
in terrible pain. So it's a sorrowful story. But you see the, the situation because he was cursing God, the church, the fasting, because he wanted to fulfill his stomach. See, we are becoming idolaters to fulfill our physical pleasure, but we are not looking to fulfill our spiritual pleasure. Because, as I said, we are spiritual beings first. And secondly, we were given the, uh, the, the, the life, the breath, the breath of God was given to that piece of earth, of soil that God made from clay and made the first man. And only after breathing upon him, he took life. So, you see, we are spiritual be beings. And our first need is to fulfill our spiritual hunger and thirst. But we are looking towards the physical, to do everything for the body, to fulfill our pleasure, but not our spiritual needs. And this is what is depriving us from God, is dividing us from God. And then we are becoming spiritually naked and in hunger and thirst because we are not doing the, it the right way. So, and this is one of the important things on our life that taking all these examples from the gospel, like look, the Ninevites, what they did for three days, they fasted, they put sacks and they put ashes on them and they fasted. But the way they fasted, that's important. You know, they left everything behind, right? And that's just everybody from the king to the last one fasted and they left all their duties and their, all their needs aside. But see, like when we, when we are just abstaining from food, we're not really fasting in our days. We don't know what the true fasting is. And I hope that we can learn the true fasting. As I said, as I mentioned, at the, the, the foundation of the fasting stands the love. If there is no love and you are lying, you are doing that, you are judging, criticizing, so then it's just an abstinence. So let, let us try, my dear ones, to implement this golden rule of love among us, to live like brothers and sisters. Only then we will achieve these, our goals and only there, there, our prayers will be fruitful. Our fasting will be fruitful. And we will be able to communicate with God as I'm talking to you. This The same way we will be able to talk to God. And he will listen to us and he will answer to our request. But see, we, we are like building a, a wall between us and God and we cannot see and as long as we cannot see we're fine and we're trying to live the way we want and we think that's fine it's okay which is not so let us try my dear ones to implement this and to renew our life because as he said again in this gospel that if if you put the new wine in the, in the old skins is going to uh, to spell, uh, spoil uh, both. So what's the benefit? Nothing. So only when we will throw away the old habits, the old man, as the Holy Fathers are saying, and live in the new, which we are renewed through the baptism, 
But again, as you take a shirt, t-shirt, whatever, and you have you wear it during the day, and you have to put it to, to wash it because otherwise it's going to start smelling if you wear it second or third day and whatever, right? So the same thing our soul. We have to continually to take care of our salvation to come to the spiritual cleansing, which is the holy confession, the holy repentance, to take it, this, this is like the washing machine to cleanse our soul, to cleanse our inner world. When we pull all the weeds, take them all through, through confession, and we're again able to move on constantly because if you live like a couple weeks you'll see that your soul is heavier it's like a big stone that millstone upon your chest that put, it puts pressure and becomes more difficult and more difficult and the shame kicks in and it's like how, how I'm going now to talk to the priest what I'm going to say I don't know how's, what he's going to think about me and all these things. Listen, the, the priest is not a judge and he is not there to judge anyone. He is, to him is given this great mystery, the great gift to be like a mediator between God and men. And he's not there to judge anyone. Why, why, what he did and why he did it is not upon him. The judge is upon. As I said, the priest is just the tool that God uses. God does it through us. And everything he does through us, he uses us as his creation. So let us, through the mysteries, participate in God's creation. And mostly to take the road to salvation and our own ascension of the ladder, of the spiritual ladder of our salvation. Amen. May God bless you all.